Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations. In this series, we talk to business executives operating on the front lines as the coronavirus pandemic destroys jobs and ravages economies. In Kaifu Lee's case, his front lines are a startup incubator in the very heart of Beijing's university district. Kaifu, welcome to this program and thanks for making the time. Thank you, Andy. So I guess you could say, Kaifu, this has been the first pandemic of the AI era. What difference has AI made and how have China's legions of AI researchers, entrepreneurs, innovators and investors responded to the challenge? Uh, well, I think very similar to the rest of the world um, because there's so much data being gathered. So AI can be applied for prediction, for uh, contact tracing, for minimizing risk, for robotics delivery, for drug discovery. Uh, so there are many, many places we could use it. And uh, certainly Chinese companies have been, uh, in the last few months, have been building smart robots for healthcare, uh, temperature check stations that can check automatically uh, and move closer to you, and, uh, and also technologies in uh, drug discovery. We can talk more about that. Uh, but having said that, I, I really think um, the AI community wasn't completely prepared for this because previously AI had been focused on internet, financial, uh, autonomous driving and things like that. Uh, but I think the good thing, the good news is, I think everyone is now uh, galvanized and excited and want to contribute. And I'm sure before the pandemic is over, we'll see a lot more contributions and certainly we'll be ready for the next one if there is a next one. What are you seeing in your own incubator? I mean, are people coming to you with ideas for new products, new services? And if so, where, where are the most exciting applications? Is it in diagnosis? We talked about vaccine discovery or is it in disease modeling? Where, where is the most, uh, where do you think AI holds the most promise from a medical perspective? Uh, sure, uh, well, we actually are, uh, larger than an incubator. We make uh, uh, mostly series A and B investments of uh, five to $10 million. So uh, we do, but we do talk to a lot of uh, medical entrepreneurs. And uh, in terms of the intersection of healthcare and AI, I think there are a couple of areas that have gotten us quite excited, uh, mostly with companies we had already invested in. Uh, for example, we have one company uh, called in silico medicine, which is looking at uh, a very clever way to uh, handicap the spread of the virus. That is by uh, blocking uh, the uh, the protein that's responsible. So they use deep learning to generate uh, new antivirals and then try to uh, essentially uh, block and disable the proteins that uh, cause the spread. It's an innovative uh, approach to uh, to do this. Um, we also have invested in a number of uh, robotics and autonomous driving companies. All of them are trying to pivot to be helpful, not necessarily profitable, but, uh, but helpful to them, to the delivery. Because as we've begun to realize, uh, the spread of uh, the, the coronavirus uh, can be largely through people who contact a lot of other people, healthcare workers, delivery, um, and um, uh, restaurant workers and so on when the restaurants were open. So uh, a lot of the companies are trying to retrofit, uh, whether it's a robotic technology um, uh, or a autonomous vehicle technology to see how they can substitute people to avoid uh, people having to take on these dangerous jobs and creating more spread. And that's been another good application. Uh, there are also a lot of applications uh, beyond uh, healthcare. Uh, but we can get to that later. So what do you think the lingering effects of COVID-19 will be on AI? Does, will it accelerate, do you think, adoption? Do you think it's going to be a more permanent part of the technology ecosystem in the future? Uh, I, I think it, it'll actually accelerate um, the use of AI, uh, partly because we'll see AI producing results in a number of areas. But more importantly, AI depends on data. And there are many... Um, scenarios in which in the past we haven't been comfortable generating data or using online 
For example, having an interview like this one, uh, but also online learning, uh, telemedicine, uh, meeting, e-meetings, e-weddings. So these are all things that are uh, really blossoming using Zoom and other platforms. But what that also creates is the data of these um, meetings and virtual presence and the opportunity to plug in so-called digital humans uh, as a sales agent or customer service rep or to answer your call when your friend is not uh, at his uh, or her computer. So all this uh, digitization um, is going to so accelerate that in the last, I would say in the last two months, the degree of digitization in the world has probably moved at a speed of two years. So we've done two years of digitization in just two months. And then we've got a few more months to go. And then that will change people's habits and people will use uh, online digital communities more and that will create more data and then that will create more opportunities uh, to plug in AI and to use AI for better predictions and um, better uh, financial results, uh, but also better uh, uh, user features. So I think this digital nature uh, is something that's going to be huge. And as I mentioned earlier, the um, robotics to do the, the human contact uh, is another big place that will blossom. So I think there will be more data, more opportunities to, uh, to use AI. So in general, East Asian economies have been far more successful than Western economies in containing this virus. Taiwan, where you are right now, is a shining example of that. Obviously, East Asia had experience with SARS and therefore they were more prepared. But to what extent do you think it has to do with the way that East Asians in generally are much more enthusiastic about adopting new technologies, including AI? Um, I do think uh, there are East Asian elements that uh, cause the number of um, uh, spread and, and the deaths to be lower in, uh, in, in East Asia. I would say first and foremost that uh, East Asian cultures are generally more um, uh, societal oriented, so collectivist societies. Uh, that are willing to use self-discipline for the good of society. And for example, there is kind of a belief that, well, everyone should wear a mask and people actually should be embarrassed if they didn't from the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and similarly, uh, if people are asked to stay at home, um, they will do that. And also, uh, if um, contact tracing uh, for the period of the pandemic takes personal data, people are not bothered by that. In fact, there are certain countries and regions that have laws that uh, allow for the period of pandemic uh, to have geolocation of each individual collected anonymously, but used to inform other people if they are in contact with someone else. So, so why, these why kinds they, of- Why are they not bothered by that, Kai Fu? Is, is, it, is it because Asians have less of a sense of, of privacy? I mean, places like, like, like Hong Kong and South Korea and Taiwan are prepared to accept a level of intrusion by the state into their personal lives, which would be totally unacceptable in the United States. I mean, is, is, it, is it a difference in, in the approach to privacy or are Asians more trusting of their governments and of big tech? Well, I think this is a philosophical question. If we go back to the roots of Eastern and Western civilization, we will see that you know, privacy, personal property, as a part of the most um, valued um, human rights are more in the Western side. It's valued in the Eastern Asian, of course, but security um, is, is even higher, uh, at least in the Asia, East Asian. I think it's maybe it's more of a higher value of um, um, security, safety. Um, and also, if this is only during the period of pandemic, I wonder if we did a survey in the US that only during the period of pandemic or such national emergency are people's data going to be used anonymously or anonymized in a way to help other people uh, to, to, to detect they might have been in contact with someone. And I wonder if maybe at least half people would say, okay, for the period of pandemic. So I, I think it's, um, it's, it's not so much a binary, uh, I want security and no privacy, or I want privacy and no security. It's kind of um, a priority uh, that, that happens. 
As far as technology adoption, uh, I, I do. Th I think that actually varies in East Asia because um, you know mainland China is very far ahead in the adoption of mobile technologies. People use a lot more data and a lot more apps and are more much more advanced. But actually, other countries in, and regions in the e Eastern Asia are are not so advanced. So I wouldn't quite uh, say it's purely the, the the fact that people would use new technology that's causing the pandemic to be less serious. So do you think the concern with privacy in the United States might doom projects like this Google, Apple, COVID-19 app that alerts for the, 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 the virus? I mean, how can this work if it's purely voluntary, if it's not universal? Uh, yeah, um, I think one could say it's better than nothing, which we all agree that they should do it if the options are having it or not having it, right? This is the Apple, Google platform which on an opt-in basis uh, remembers people who've been in contact with each other uh, through Bluetooth and through, through voluntary self-reporting if someone's got it. So you're really multiplying a number of probabilities, right? What's the likelihood that uh, both people have Bluetooth on and both people uh, opt in? Um, and also, uh, if one of the person got the coronavirus, they would self-report. We're talking about way less than 1% of the contacts. So it isn't all that effective. Uh, if one could wave a magic wand, uh, one could say, look, if you can just make it opt out and over the period only if the national pandemic emergency, I think the value would go way up. It would be maybe 50% reported rather than 1% reported. Uh, but unfortunately, I think people are uh, due to recent uh, events related to uh, Facebook, um, Cambridge Analytica, people are really spooked by this um, giving my data to anybody. So it really isn't in the cards, which is a shame because it is effective. So at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, as you know, we've talked a lot about the US-China tech Cold War. In the AI space particularly, do you think COVID-19 has accelerated that conflict or are we seeing evidence of collaboration, of data sharing? What are you seeing across the, across the Pacific? Well, we're seeing a lot of data uh, collection efforts happening and shared uh, between China, US, but, and, but also among all countries. So from a private sector, we're actually seeing uh, researchers, engineers um, uh, really become excited and galvanized and uh, willing to contribute and work together towards the common goal of um, uh, eradicating this, um, this, this pandemic. Uh, from the countries, I think all the countries have been busy on the pandemic issues. So I don't think any um, technical um, tr or trade war issues have been uh, escalated for, the, for this period of time. I would really hope that a common enemy, that is the coronavirus, uh, will cause countries to overlook whatever different had and work together against this common uh, uh, enemy and, and, and maybe some success will cause the relationships to to, to begin to turn positive. But I, I, maybe I'm too optimistic, hope for that, but it would seem possible. We'll see. So, so Kaifu, we've talked a lot about AI successes in combating uh, uh, COVID-19. What about the limitations? What have we discovered about that? Let's be honest, AI hasn't been very helpful in predicting the spread of the disease, forecasting infections and deaths. The whole world is still basically flying blind why? Well, AI learns from data, data that is um, basically becomes a pattern, right? So if you see a lot of pedestrians, you predict how they walk. If you listen to a lot of speech, you understand what words mean. But pandemics come once a century, at least pandemic of this scale. And the data is uh, useless. If you go back to 1917, 1918, there was no data to be had. Um, so, so unfortunately, uh, the, the uh, prediction and the use of data, um, I think, makes it a little bit difficult for, um, for to predict, to, to basically totally avoid the pandemic. However, I would say that even early on, there were a couple of labs that have found um, uh, aberrations in the data that 
there was a larger percentage than usual pneumonia in Wuhan and raised the flag. So there are still things that you can do. You're not really necessarily spotting for the, another pandemic, but you're spotting for anomaly. That's actually something AI is good at. I do think going forward, anomaly detection, which has largely been used in uh, minimizing failure of trains and uh, things like that uh, for AI, using AI, now could be used for uh, pandemic um, uh, pred prediction. And, and also, I think for, uh, for drug discovery, um, I think the accelerated need, I think will push us to see. So I think it'd be interesting to see uh, when the vaccine is finally discovered, to what extent was it aided or accelerated uh, by uh, AI technologies. Uh, um, my bet is um, there should be larger than 50% chance that AI had, had at least a modest role or, or maybe larger than mo at least a modest role to play in the uh, development of the vaccine. There's been quite a bit of skepticism, however, about some AI-driven uh, diagnostic applications. For instance, this Baidu thermal imaging technology that's supposed to see fevers, which apparently, I read, throws up a lot of false positives. Um, is that kind of skepticism uh, warranted? Is it teething problems or is it something more fundamental around the technology? Um, I think a lot of uh, companies are just eager to help. So they launch uh, experimental solutions. Um, and I think it's a teething problem as, as you described. Um, most of the examples I gave, you know, robots to deliver medical supplies, I don't think anyone's tried them before. Uh, they just saw a need uh, and then they developed it, a ways to measure and guess people's temperature. People never thought about that. Uh, you know, discover and uh, warn people who aren't wearing a facial mask. No one's ever done that before. So these are, uh, P I think people are basically launching their alpha or beta products. And um, um, understandably, they're not perfect. And uh, the good thing about AI is you gather more data and, and then you retrain it and it gets better. So I think um, uh, this will get better over the next few months. It does seem though that even in this AI era, there is no substitute for human ingenuity and accumulated human knowledge and, and wisdom. I mean, much has been talked about these data researchers in Boston who use natural language uh, techniques to uh, go through Chinese social media sites and alert, and apparently they, they claim, or it is claimed, that they were the first to raise the red flag about coronavirus in China. Nevertheless, we, we know that it was doctors on the front lines in Wuhan who were first noticing this human, human trans, uh, transmission and were at least trying to, to warn about it. How, how do you, in general, how do you look at this dichotomy between human intelligence, artificial intelligence, man versus machine? I think artificial intelligence is just a tool. So if a tool had been developed with the data in place, it can do a great job, generally better than people. Uh, but a tool needs to be uh, bootstrapped by uh, people, uh, run by people, and then its results checked by people and potentially disabled by people. So really people are in charge. And to the extent AI has made contributions, it's people who've uh, invented, uh, engineered, and um, uh, operated these AI products that uh, for, for whom the credit is due. Uh, but I actually agree with you. I think uh, AI really gets a B minus for this, um, uh, its contributions to the uh, COVID-19. Um, mostly because we haven't done it before. I think next time, hopefully we'll get an A. But even when we get an A, I think the heroes will always be the people. Right. One last question. You, you said that you think that AI AI will, or there's a good chance that AI will contribute to the discovery of a vaccine. Is it more likely that we'll get a vaccine in the US or China? What would be the implications of that? I mean, is this the ultimate test of the big question? Will the US or China be the dominant AI superpower? <laughs> well, uh, so first, when I say AI make a contribution, it is still the human who will invent the vaccine. Uh, AI can contribute in doing virus RNA structure prediction, in trying to figure out which uh, cases to try and which 
which ones are most likely to work. It can help in fitting the, um, the, the, mo um, the molecule into a protein, things like that. So I, I think I, I will, uh, I would say that AI is likely to contribute in that way, but it's the human and the drug company uh, that, will create, that will create the vaccine. Uh, I, I think actually, I, I just spoke to uh, David Ho, who is a famous uh, American, uh, who uh, worked on uh, uh, HIV, and uh, his, um, his uh, objective uh, observation is that the Chinese sciences are advancing so that by the time the American scientists got onto the scene looking at purely, this is not the AI, purely the medical side of the research, and if they see that the Chinese scientists have done a very credible job, which uh, they, uh, the Chinese scientists graciously uh, and, and of course, they should uh, hand over to the American scientists. So in his view, uh, the American scientists are stronger, but the Chinese scientists are solid and helpful. I think that's from a, a medical research point of view. Uh, from an AI point of view, I, I think um, the chi Chinese and US scientists, I think will probably will contribute equally because they're both um, uh, very, very qualified, the top two groups of researchers in the world. And I also hope they will work together the same way that the medical researchers work together. Kai-Fu Lee, that's an optimistic note to end on. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.